keep a file in here, but um, welcome everybody. Welcome to Advanced Transportation and Logistics Community Practice um, for coming back and what are the plans and protocols. Um, today's webinar is going to be kind of like an exploratory look into what your peers are doing in the state. Um, our speaker will be addressing things like PPE, protocols, social distancing, sanitation of tools, workflow, and other considerations that need to be taken um, or need to be addressed. Our speaker today is uh, Mariana Rubio from Citrus College. Um, and Mariana, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, it's, it's great to see a lot of familiar faces. Um, very happy to be here. I'm from Citrus College. Uh, automotive instructor, heavy truck instructor, and stationary power generation instructor. And so uh, I'm working with not just the automotive program, but other programs on my campus uh, and working out some details as to how we're gonna return onto campus. Uh, inevitably, at some point, our programs are gonna come back to campus uh, unless we've, we've decided to go elect the way of, of going uh, fully online. And I think some courses might benefit from that. Some programs might benefit from integrating that. But a lot of our courses, of course, we have to consider what we're going to do once we go back uh, on campus. Now, I know other programs uh, have already started doing that throughout the state and throughout the country. And so I'm going to share some of the stuff that came up, came up from our automotive side, from our diesel side, uh, power generation side, and even other programs like our nursing program, our cosmetology program, and just share some of the ideas uh, that we have. Uh, so thank you. Um, it'll be a great day today. Awesome. So just kind of give you guys a layout of how the, um, the presentation will go is Marianne will present for about 25, 30 minutes or so. Um, and then we're going to open up the webinar to um, some discussion questions. If anybody other has like some best practices, um, that kind of stuff. So uh, please feel free to use the chat box. And if you don't know how to do that, you just click the, um, the attendees, shoot, where is it? the participants, and then you'll see the little, um, or no, sorry, there's a chat box and then there's also a wave the hand and we'll call on you. Um, if you have any questions about that, let us know. Uh, Mariano, would you like to share your screen? Uh, sure. Uh, let me switch over real quick. So give me a sec, guys. And let me get this going. All right, so um, thank you again for, for being here today. Um, just going to talk about some lab reopening strategies. Uh, and again, I kind of uh, saw what was going on with the, the different programs we have. Um, you know, of course, this, uh, I'm, I'm mainly focusing on the automotive side here because we are the automotive group. Um, so just some ideas that uh, we are developing at Citrus College uh, in our automotive program. And, uh, you know, we, we are an OEM sponsored Toyota sponsored program. Uh, and so, you know, there's, there's a, a, a great community out there uh, from that side. There's a lot of great information from there. Uh, there's also great information coming in from other programs as well. So today I just want to share some of the ideas uh, that are popping up and uh, hopefully give you guys uh, some great ideas and maybe get some feedback from you guys as well. So uh, we've been thrust into this paradigm. This is, you know, a, a crazy time for us. Uh, but you know what? I think we've we've definitely stepped up to the challenge. Uh, we've gotten really knowledgeable with a lot of our resources online. I mean, we've had multiple uh, webinars where we talked about, uh, you know, these electronic sources uh, like Electude and, and, and some of these uh, other sources where we're integrating some of this uh, web-based learning uh, into our programs, which is great. And, and we're becoming better and better at this. And hopefully that trend uh, continues. Uh, we've been really getting really good with uh, using our learning management system. So uh, again, it's just all new stuff for some of us. Uh, I certainly didn't utilize uh, my learning management system at Citrus Canvas to its fullest ability. I still haven't, but I've, I've, I'm using a lot more of it. But now what? So what are we gonna do and, and what do we have to think about? Um, are we going to stay as an online instructional in an online instructional format? Uh, that could be for one class or maybe for the entire program. You know, depends on on your particular program. Uh, if so, there are great resources and curriculum available, and uh, I'll just quickly talk about that uh, in the next uh, couple of slides coming up. But we have to strategize how we're going to reopen our labs, even if partially. So I'm going to throw out some ideas. 
and then uh, we can talk about it afterwards. So some of the points that I want to make sure we, we cover today is uh, just want to uh, figure out how to integrate some of this new these newfound resources into our traditional lecture and lab curriculum. Uh, so even though we're going to go back into kind of a lab setting, we still want to retain some of the uh, knowledge we've gained from just teaching remotely and these resources that uh, have opened up for us. Uh, how do we establish lab environment protocols? Uh, how do we establish screening procedures and schedules for students? Is that something that we have to do or worry about? Is that something we have to talk to our administration about? Uh, how do we determine what PPE protocols uh, are required? Uh, and then cleaning and disinfecting supplies. I mean, where do we find out where that's coming from? And then, uh, you know, we should probably establish some sort of process for cleaning tools and common, common touch points on vehicles and equipment. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through those points. And again, think about those. And if you have any questions, we'll talk about it afterwards. So safety first, uh, before your students enter the lab, you know, we have to always think about safety, no matter whether we're dealing with our automotive program, uh, in my case, you know, heavy truck program. Uh, before our students enter the lab, we have to make sure we devote some time to lecture about any uh, safety protocols in the lab, and not just the, the regular ones, the normal ones we talk about, but some of the new shop protocols that we're gonna put in place. So, uh, and I know, again, other OEM programs have developed this, but consider developing a lab sheet that allows students to view things like the COVID-19 CDC recommendations. Or if you've developed your own shop protocols, you know, have them answer questions on that so they start thinking about what they're supposed to be doing. And so just like how we train on uh, lifting vehicles safely, using uh, tools properly, we should really be implementing some sort of training to our students uh, as far as guidelines in the shop. So what new resources do we have? Well, uh, you know, we talked about in, in prior webinars, uh, you know, all these all new online content uh, packages that we that we can get for our programs. Uh, so online su supplemental content is great and it, it works well in, in some areas. Um, and you see a picture here of a, a VR headset. So, you know, augmenting or adding virtual reality instruction is now a possibility, something we really didn't consider before all this happened. And so I do have a link on the bottom. I'll let you watch that on your own. And so this, this particular link uh, goes over to uh, the Transfer VR uh, site. And, uh, you know, I think they're doing some great stuff, some incredible stuff. Uh, I actually think it would be a great supplement to uh, some of our programs. Though the company, even the CEO of the company has said, it's not gonna be a complete replacement for what we can do with our hands. You know, there's not a virtual way to feel that torque on that wrench. So it's, it's a great supplement, but, uh, you know, not necessarily a, a full replacement in all cases. However, that being said, that might be something to consider in some of the areas in your program. Uh, for example, if there's like, a, a, you want the student to maybe uh, learn how to do a procedure first, that might be, uh, uh, you know, somewhat dangerous if they're not using the proper procedure, this might be a good alternative to get them to or introduce them uh, to do that sort of stuff. So ultimately, uh, our traditional instruction uh, isn't going to be the same anymore, right? Our paradigm has shifted. We now have to think about how we're going to integrate all these tools, which I think is a great process. I think it's a great thing. So now let's talk about going back into the lab. So uh, I'm going to use Citrus College as the example, and that's only because I got pictures of Citrus College. I haven't I uh, had a chance to take pictures of any other programs shop, but uh, what, let's let's talk about if we're going to set up a return to our shop. What is that, that going to look like? What are the things we have to think about as we go back in? So what you see here is, is a fine picture of our uh, engine diagnostic uh, or vehicle diagnostic shop. Uh, and you can see we have our vehicles parked on one side with uh, toolboxes on the other side and pony walls. Now, each shop is going to be different, and you're going to have to start thinking about different considerations, uh, such as how far are the toolboxes apart, or do you have tool carts that you can keep apart a certain distance? Uh, do we have to add barriers? You know, do we have six feet from one side of the toolbox to the other side? And if not, is, 
So we have to start thinking about barriers. And then the vehicles themselves, are they far enough apart where I can uh, have students work safely distance from each other? And I wanna remind everyone, CDC still recommends the six foot rule where uh, it is recommended that people stay six feet apart from each other. However, uh, with barriers, uh, you can actually get a little bit closer. Or if there's a, a case where potentially you can have someone get closer than six feet, then a barrier really should be considered. So we were fortunate enough to look at our architectural drawings. Now, I realize not every school and not every program is gonna have access to their architectural drawings. So you, you literally would have to go out and take some tape measures and just see how everything is laid out and see what sort of spacing you have. This at least gave us a, a good idea of how we're laid out on our own uh, program. So uh, we're looking at this and we're looking at things and asking questions like, can we space out the vehicles far enough or do we have to maybe have a, a vehicle in every other stall? Uh, if we add barriers, where can we add them? And are they, they even necessary? So some of the barriers we're thinking of were like these just uh, shield barriers. These would great work great for like our pony walls. And we realized that we're, we're not quite at six feet going from one end of the toolbox of the on one side of the pony wall to the other. So we're thinking, what if we add a shield in between? We might have to do that if we're gonna uh, have students working from one side to the other. And if there's a potential for the student to be uh, students uh, to be close enough, uh, are we going to have to add like a wall barrier like this? Now, of course, we have to consider the cost of all this and whether our school uh, can provide this uh, for us. Uh, if if that's available, that's great. If not, then we're going to have to figure out some workarounds. Now, uh, one thing that we considered was how do we move students if we have two or three students uh, at a vehicle, how do we move students around, around these vehicles as, we're, as they're doing their lab activities? We still want them to maintain at least a six foot distance. And so uh, one idea, and this was actually my colleague from Citrus College, Priscilla Engler. Uh, she's like, well, let's, let's play with some geometry here. Let's, let's just put out a scenario. We have several students that need to complete a lab sheet. Uh, in the case of the left-hand vehicle, it could be a scan tool lab sheet uh, where we want them to complete the lab sheet, get their uh, hands on the scan tool and do the work on the vehicle. And if they have, if we have other students nearby that need to also do the lab sheet, perhaps we can keep them spaced. And this could work if you have to have a, like a team setting, a uh, two person or in some programs, a three person team. So you can see some of the geometry we played with. So here essentially it's just an equilateral triangle uh, it doesn't have to be equilateral, but as long as everyone's six feet apart. And what we're thinking of doing is spacing the students and then rotating the students uh, after a certain amount of time. So perhaps after 15 minutes or 20 minutes working on the lab sheet, uh, they can switch. And what this allows the students to do is to be able to still communicate with each other. Um, to they, some, some of the students can write down the information as the student in the vehicle uh, can go through and uh, actually work on with the scan tool. And then after about 15 minutes, uh, we can do a switch or after 20 minutes, we could do a switch. Uh, and they just basically just rotate around. And the same thing would work like if we're working under the hood, uh, basically again, two person or three person uh, team, depending on the program. Uh, if we have a two person team, it makes it a little bit easier. If we have a three person team, we just have to kind of accommodate that. But the idea is, again, we want them to be spaced and have one student working on the vehicle at, uh, up until a certain point in time and then have the students rotate. So again, maybe after 15 or 20 minutes time, you know, call out kind of a, call out a rotation and have the students rotate. And this, the student on one end can very easily walk around the vehicle while the other students just kind of shift over. And that way, students are still engaged. Uh, there's still a little bit of, bit of that team atmosphere. And in our case, what we're doing is we're ac actually having our students make up some of the labs that they've missed this uh, spring and this summer. So we have to consider the uh, time uh, that uh, this is all going to take. And so, uh, again, I'm kind of using the Citrus College layout 
your program might be different. Your layout might be a little bit different, but uh, you know, we wanna kind of figure out how we can lay everything out and lay, have the students apart far enough and still have these tasks uh, being completed. Uh, so in some cases, like in my diesel shop, the diesel shop at Citrus, we can, our workstations are not bolted to the ground. We can actually move the stations around. And so this is kind of, an, uh, again, a floor plan of our diesel shop. And so uh, we've been considering just moving our stations around within our diesel shop so that we can maintain that six foot distance. And in a lot of cases, we actually have more than six feet. So uh, again, if you can't move the vehicles, and in this case, like uh, uh, with the diesel shop, we can move our boxes, we're gonna resituate the, our shop layout to be able to accommodate that. So that means there is gonna be some setup time and of course, you're going to have to work your, with your administrator to figure out uh, who can move this, uh, whether it's going to be yourself or you're going to be guiding the facilities department on campus to maybe help move some equipment. Uh, I know like in some cases, we had our hydraulic benches right next to each other, but now we got to separate those out. And th that's something that probably is going to require forklift and, and have our facilities uh, department do that. But uh, again, this is something you have to consider if you're going to be spreading things out. So uh, what about screening process or procedures for students? So, you know, we're developing uh, a process to try to have students screened in as they're coming into on campus uh, and specifically into our program in our uh, lab area. So we're not gonna be holding classes, uh, we're not gonna be holding uh, lectures uh, on campus uh, for summer or fall uh, but the idea is we do, we are going to be holding labs, uh, maybe at the end of summer, hopefully into fall. And so we're still going to have a screening process where the students, when they come in, uh, they have to go through like a checklist and uh, be checked. Um, so consider perhaps developing a screening questionnaire uh, and perhaps even with the temperature measurement. Now, in our case, we're not going to be doing it directly. It's going to be handled through our campus safety. Uh, and so check with your administration to see if there's a process already in place or something that's being developed uh, where the students uh, will be able to get screened uh, somewhere on campus and then be able to walk over to your particular area. Uh, we're going to limit items entering into the lab area because there is, a, you know, this concern that if they start bringing in their, their book bags and even their cell phones and laptops, you know, uh, are things contaminated? Can, can you know, things, uh, as they set things down on benches and they're, they're contaminated, we want to limit that possibility. Um, now, and also, you know, if uh, we don't want the student to be working on something and then, you know, we want them to, to go through the lab, complete their lab assignments, and, you know, we don't want them to, to get uh, sidetracked with anything. So we're actually going to limit the uh, amount of items that the student brings into our lab area. Um, and then we want to make sure that the student knows that uh, they are required to wear a certain amount of PPE. So you want to have some sort of acknowledgement by the student. Now this could be written uh, where every time they enter the campus, they have to sign off that they, these are the rules. You have to wear uh, a face mask. You have to, uh, uh, you know, uh, only be in the lab area and not congregate elsewhere. Uh, and so, uh, you want to have some sort of acknowledgement by the student so that they uh, understand what the rules are. And it's kind of a great good reminder for them every time they come onto campus. Hey, look, you're here to work. We have to complete these labs uh, and we have to be mindful of what's what's still going on with with uh, the virus. And then, of course, consider establishing a written guide for your students uh, in the lab area. And you're going to have to consult your, your own school and see what the practices are for the school if, if it's already been developed. And, uh, and if it hasn't, I mean, this is, this is the time to start thinking about that. So establish a written guide for students uh, following uh, lab and college-wide practices. So uh, it, once the students are in the lab, how are we, you know, we're, we're thinking about how are we going to uh, separate them and organize them? So in our case, uh, on our automotive side, uh, we're gonna be using two person teams. Uh, our heavy truck side, we actually, uh, 
we have less number of trucks than we do cars. So we actually are going to have to be using a, a, a three team setup, but we have a, a larger shop and, and larger vehicles on the heavy truck side. So if space allows a three team uh, person team can, can work. Uh, we're going to have our labs uh, going on for anywhere between four to eight hours, depending on the particular class. And it's typically going to be uh, two meetings per week. And so we're basically going to schedule our students to only be in the lab for a certain number of hours, uh, depending on the particular class. And that means that students are going to have to take breaks at the same time. Uh, you know, we want to keep track of everyone. Um, and what this allows us to do is to make sure that we're there for each of our teams as we're going around, as the teams are going around and, and completing the lab sheets. Uh, so we, we want to, of course, still be able to assist each team. And then uh, determine if your school is going to allow eating on campus for these breaks uh, or off campus. And again, some of our classes, if they go, you know, six hours, seven hours, uh, we're probably going to have some sort of meal break in between. Uh, and so in our case, they're most likely not going to be eating on campus. Uh, but now we got to consider on the return, are they going to have to get screened again? So uh, that's something, again, you want to talk with your administration about. Uh, and then are you going to need to set up uh, lab makeup times for any, any sort of missed spring or summer lab content? Again, in our case, in our particular case, we are going to require students uh, to complete uh, the lab portions that they missed during this last spring. And we're not going to be opening up uh, right at the beginning of summer. So there's going to be some lab content we're also going to have to backfill. Uh, but we are going to require students to complete that lab content. So, um, but that's in our particular case. Your program might be a little bit different, but if you have to make up these lab times, how are you going to do it? And how are you going to organize the students? Um, so uh, when the students come on, on site, they're only there to complete the labs. We don't, you know, we're not going to have uh, lectures in our particular case on campus. And then once the students are done with their labs, they have to leave. We're going to show them away and say, okay, you're done. You're out. We don't want you to stick around. So once they're done with their assignment, they have to leave immediately. And uh, you want to make sure you remind them, alert them. Don't congregate in any space on campus, including parking lots. We don't want them uh, there uh, kind of hanging out after they're done, say, oh, man, that was rough. I had to wear the mask the whole time. Look, go talk on the phone, go Zoom, can't be on campus. Uh, and remind the students that the threat of spreading the virus is still real and it can occur anywhere. People are still getting sick and unfortunately people are still dying. So this, this threat is still there. So, you know, remind your students, this, this hasn't gone away and we have to uh, do our best to make sure it doesn't get worse or limit how far it gets worse. So uh, students are going to be responsible for cleaning the tools, vehicles, and equipment at the very end uh, once they're done with their lab assignment. So uh, we're going to actually instruct the students as to uh, how to clean the tools and everything towards the very end. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit more about the exiting process a little bit later. So uh, lab environment protocols, basically, uh, we're going to make sure face masks are worn uh, prior to entry and while they're in the facility. Uh, students and instructors, we're still going to be following the six foot recommendation. Uh, we are going to ask our students to be wearing gloves. And then once they remove them, of course, dispose of them properly as per the CDC guidelines. And what if a student gets sick? Well, we're going to ask them to, uh, we're going to first of all separate them. And we're going to let them know, hey, let us know if you're not feeling good for any reason, you know. So we can separate you. We're not sure what's going on. And then you want to follow your school's lab safety procedure. And so it, it probably has changed with, or is going to change uh, with everything going on. So whether it's calling campus safety to alert them, I have a student that doesn't feel very well. Uh, you know, just follow your school's safety procedure once you separate them out. Uh, also uh, remind your uh, students and uh, others around you Still continue doing the uh, the proper hand washing technique. The 20 second rule is still applying. So make sure that they understand that. If you're gonna be using hand sanitizer, uh, just make sure that it's at least a 60% alcohol uh, hand sanitizer. And then uh, when they remove the gloves, and it, sometimes it's hard to do, but you wanna make sure that you let people know if they're removing their glove, you wanna do it without touching uh, the outside of the glove with fingers. 
So um, I'm going to show you an example of how I'm establishing this rotation schedule for the students. Uh, and so this is straight off of my page from uh, Canvas. And so, uh, and this is just an example. Uh, this may not work for everyone, but I had to kind of figure out and think of how am I going to have students return to the campus? Uh, first of all, to make up the labs that they've missed. And second of all, uh, now with the uh, new group of students coming in, how am I going to establish a time frame to be able to accommodate both the my normal schedule and now uh, this other time frame I need for the makeup labs? And so, and also be able to, to consider uh, the student's availability for uh, the makeup labs. So it dawned on me, well, we have this thing called collaborations on Canvas. Um, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. It's actually kind of like a Google Docs through your own Canvas. And so this works really well if you can get all your students' uh, Gmail accounts. And you basically you set up a Google Doc through Canvas and they can all contribute and they can sign themselves up to a spreadsheet that you develop yourself. So for example, the first one I set up was a team sign up. I, and so you could read right there, I, I told them, I want you to sign up onto a team and uh, I want no more than two people per team. And these are the teams I'm going to put in a certain schedule uh, as we're going through the labs. So what I did was I set up the spreadsheet super simple spreadsheet, nothing crazy, just so that they can put their own names down. And I didn't type it in, I let them type it in. Of course, uh, uh, if, if you need to, of course you can set up your own teams. I kind of let the students choose on their own just so I can see what's going on. And then, um, and I made sure to let the students know, make sure you, you choose someone that you have communication with either through email, uh, personal phone number, uh, someone you can communicate out off of campus with not interact with face-to-face, uh, -face, but someone you can communicate with. And so they all chose the people that they do have contact with. Um, and then once they chose that, what I did was I had them uh, sign into uh, a second spreadsheet where I was looking at the lab times that were available for that particular class. And again, I'm being, this is actually for a class that's gonna need to make up some lab time. And so uh, I let them, I gave them the spreadsheet with the openings as to when they can sign in and they can select when they can sign in. And so basically as they come in, I'll already have the lab sheet ready for them and I'll tell them, okay, uh, you need to complete this lab sheet. I, I tell them how much time they have. If they can complete it within that time, they're good. If they need to come back, then they basically just schedule themselves again to come back and do that. Now it's easier for the classes uh, that I'm not making up labs for, that I'm currently, uh, that we're gonna be uh, coming in during the summer and fall. Again, this is more for the, the students that have to make up the labs from the spring. But this was kind of an idea that I had, uh, and, and it, it's at least a way for me to organize the students and see what time frame I have to get them to complete all their labs. This does require you to uh, kind of get a good estimate as to how long it's gonna take to do those labs. So what sort of procedures should we follow? What guidelines should we follow? So the CDC website is the uh, still the standard. We're still gonna follow uh, everything that's recommended by the CDC website. For example, what face coverings to use, how to put the face coverings on. It's really good information directly off the CDC website. Uh, gloves, we're gonna actually have our students uh, wear gloves in the shop. Of course, safety glasses are still a must. Uh, face shields. In some cases, you might not be able to have complete barriers between students. And if there's any chance of them getting uh, even closer than six feet, we want to make sure we have at least face shields uh, on the students. And then, of course, still try to continue following that six foot rule uh, wherever possible. So the CDC website actually does have a link uh, as to recommendations for colleges and universities. So I highly recommend, uh, I have the link written right here. You can always go to the CDC website and just type in colleges and universities. Some really good information specifically to instructors. Uh, and uh, so I highly encourage you, if you have a chance, read through that and see what they have. Now, our own state has uh, its own guidelines. So this is actually from the uh, Department of Public Health. Uh, and they themselves also have kind of the guidelines. Now they do refer a lot to the CDC. So again, the CDC is kind of the standard, but uh, our state department, uh, public health department 
uh, actually put on some <clears throat> or uh, put scenarios on the page that actually explain what to do in case a student gets sick uh, or faculty member gets sick, uh, what processes we sh California still requires by institutions. Uh, so again, this is, you know, I wish we had more time to go a little bit more in depth into that, but when you have a chance, or if you have a chance, please look up that page from our uh, Department of Public Health. Uh, uh, there's a lot of good information, especially on the link that has to do with uh, higher education guidance. And so uh, the CDC website uh, does have uh, a list that shows what sort of cleaning supplies we should be using and what surfaces it can be used on. And so it's a pretty large uh, list. It's a pretty comprehensive list. And so, uh, you know, this is something that, again, I'm not sure if, if like in our case, we're not going to be really handling the purchasing of this, but it's something you want to definitely bring up to your administration as to what sort of cleaning supplies are we going to be getting for disinfecting. So uh, with those cleaning supplies, of course, we want to clean our, our tools and touch points. So we have to consider what sort of, uh, what portions of the vehicle uh, do we have to be cleaning? So there's going to be different touch points that we want to make sure uh, vehicles get cleaned on. And so uh, this is a time where we can instruct our own students as to where exactly they can clean on the vehicle if they're common touch points, if they're going to be doing a particular lab. Uh, you want to just see, okay, where's, where's, where are there going to be points where uh, students are going to be touching? And, and once they're done, uh, we want to make sure that they can wipe that down. So an example is here, just the passenger car. And I did pretty much the same thing for the heavy, medium, heavy truck program, just kind of uh, as a guidance as to, hey, if the students are touching the handles here or touching the steps here, uh, you know, we want to make sure that they wipe that down. And even on the interior, you know, if there's uh, surfaces that students touch, you want to make sure that that gets wiped down. Now, again, you want to refer to the CDC guideline as to what cleaning solution to use on what material. Uh, but that's something that you want to certainly uh, instruct the students on. And in some cases, uh, if you have lab aides or lab technicians, uh, they can assist in this. But you certainly want to instruct your own students on doing this so that as they're finishing up their tasks, they can also be able to wipe down uh, particular areas. Even if they're wearing gloves, even if they're wearing face masks and everything else, we want to uh, minimize the possibility of exposure to this virus. And then checklists for vehicles and workstations. Uh, so I thought this was a great idea, so I'm not gonna claim this as my own, but uh, you know, even with uh, tools and uh, workstation items, you wanna make sure that you have some sort of checklist to be able to uh, sign off that things have been wiped. And uh, again, this could be something that the students do, but you as the instructor in the shop want to make sure that things are done properly and you can kind of oversee the cleaning process as they're finishing that up. So, uh, you know, you want to develop some sort of list to kind of just check off. And this could be on a particular uh, shop uh, toolkit, uh, or this could be just kind of a generalized uh, list but you wanna make sure you, you're keeping track of where students are wiping everything down. So those are some ideas. Um, you know, I, I think we've been getting a lot of good comments here. So thank you all very much for hearing me out this morning. Uh, if you have any questions, here's my uh, email address, mruby at citruscollege.edu. Uh, I'd be happy to chat. Uh, if you have any good recommendations, please let me know. Uh, and uh, yeah, thank you guys, appreciate it. Thank you, Miranda. So we wanted to open up the last uh, 27 minutes or so to um, discussions, best practices, questions you might have uh, for Mariano. So if you guys want to raise your hands or use the chat box, um, you can go pretty casual here. Um, okay, I'll raise my hand. <laughs> <laughs> so um, may I speak? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So uh, Mark Burnbeck from Evergreen Valley College, we, um, we thought we had the green light on conducting lab there. And so, um, well, actually in the spring, we, we were running uh, small labs, we were limited to eight people. And, uh, and now uh, the County of Santa Clara uh, told us that uh, we had to stop. So our labs were not considered, um, I think they're only allowing health labs. Now, this is secondhand information 
This is also my cat. But anyhow, um, secondhand information. So I don't know directly um, what they said in those conversations for Santa Clara, but um, we're in a holding pattern right now. I do want to say, though, in the few days that I did lab, wearing the gloves and having the alcohol spray, the mask, um, it, it, was a, it was very good precautionary uh, stuff. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm just saying it seemed like we were doubling up on, on preventions, right? Having the gloves and then also because we didn't even touch the tools with our hands, it's like secondary then to spray them off. And that would be from vapor, you know. So um, anyhow, that was our experience. And uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be here uh, getting information from you guys. Uh, nice PowerPoints, by the way, with the cleaning points of the car. I like that. Well, I'm not, I'm not going to take full credit for that. Uh, and again, this is, uh, we, we do have the OEM sponsor on our end. They, they did a great job in putting a lot of the stuff together. So uh, shout out to uh, the T10 community for that. But, uh, you know, and, and the subject was brought up before. And uh, in my case, I actually was thinking about my uh, power generators, my uh, diesel power generators. And I was like, well, wait a minute. Students are going to have to sit there and touch all this stuff. Uh, we have to start thinking about what, you know, if they're going to be touching it, you know, if the glove rips, I, I want to make sure that we, uh, we double up, kind of like what you said, kind of double up on the precaution there. Well, scan tools could get a little plastic film over them, right? I mean, just like at the grocery right. store. Yeah. Yeah, it's just saran wrap around it. Right. Looks like yeah. we have a question from Greg. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> first off, uh, thanks, Mariana, for putting this together. Uh, a lot of hard work went into it. I know it. Um, transparency, I'm from the same college Mr. Rubio is at, and uh, he, he's a very hard worker at this kind of stuff, very diligent. But, um, <clears throat> uh, Working off of the, the last commenter, uh, Rubio, can you just um, add a little bit to um, doubling up on prevention? Because we had talked about putting in uh, or using face shields and um, adding to that to the screens. At what point do you think that, um, do you think that the shields are better or like a, a barrier is better for most schools? I, there's a couple of variables there at play. Um, cost is going to be one of them. Uh, face shields, are, especially the, the light face shields, not the uh, heavy duty ones that you would use on a grinder, but just the light face shields generally are a little bit cheaper than, being, than having to purchase these larger barriers. Uh, so cost could be an issue there. And it also depends on certain portions of the shop. Uh, for example, if uh, vehicles are going to be distanced uh, a certain amount apart and you're not exactly sure if the students are going to be able to maintain that six foot distance, then the barrier is probably going to be a good option uh, for you there. Uh, as an instructor, I'm planning on wearing a face shield because I know I'm going to have to, you know, there's going to be a, a good possibility of myself getting uh, within six feet of my students. And so I want to make sure that I'm wearing that face shield for my students' sake. Uh, so, you know, uh, you might have to use both in conjunction with each other. So I think it really depends on uh, kind of your layout of the shop, whether your program uh, can purchase those, and then whether how, how mobile are the students going to be to each other and yourself to your students. If you're going to be uh, kind of going back and forth with students, you probably want to wear that face shield. Uh, you know, if you're going to have an area where the cars are going to be kind of close to each other and there might be a possibility where the students might be within that six foot range, then put a barrier in between. Hey, you know, <clears throat> Mr. Ruby, if I can jump in real quick again. Um, I really like what you just said. And, and I think it's something that we really need to remember is that uh, we are protecting others and we are protecting students and, and we are exposed to all of the students all the time. Whereas the students come in, they may be exposed to three or four other people. So I think that we really, as educators, need to keep in mind that we need to go that extra mile um, <clears throat> to protect our students and our faculty and ourselves. So I, I, I really appreciate that comment from you. That was, that was awesome. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Looks like we have a question from Priscilla. Hey, how's it going? Um, this question is actually for Mark uh, Burnback. I was curious. I'm sorry, I didn't catch whether or not you were, you actually worked with students with the PPE on. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, um, I'm curious to see, or if you have any advice, how did that go with the students and their buy-in and their actual um, 
having them wear all the PPE? Do they have a, do they have a mask? Do they have a shield? The whole gamut? Were they, were they in, in for it? Oh yeah. So, um, well, we're, we're very strict. We had, um, a couple of things we did is we posted on Canvas to uh, look at the CDC website. And then um, uh, my colleague, Mike Hernandez, he got a few important videos, um, mainly about masks and social distancing. And then we announced that if you're coming to lab, then you have to wear a mask. Bring gloves if you can. Uh, I bought a bunch of gloves, though. I had medium and large gloves. So we had plenty of gloves in case they ripped them. And then what they would do is uh, they'd meet up at a specific time and um, they would each, you know, write down their name on a roster and I'd have to report that later. Um, and then uh, we, we had taped off in the lobby six feet. So they'd stand apart from each other. They'd already come in with their masks on. And I also bought a, a whole bunch of masks too. I've got little paper masks for them too. Um, and um, we, then we have, you know, the infrared temperature uh, guns in the, in the shop. And so we used those and just aimed at their forehead. And uh, temperature readings varied usually around like 92, 93, you know, um, skin temperature. And then um, uh, that cleared it for that. Uh, and also they had to sign a kind of a waiver that we had made with, all, you know, a bunch of guidelines in it. And then... Um, they were great. And also we limited the labs to eight so I could watch each one of them. And I kept reminding them, look, you have to wear the mask. Um, I have plenty of it. If there's rips or anything, or if your gloves rips, I can give you those. Oh, and I'm sorry. The other step we did that I didn't tell you about the check-in was, you know, um, the roster, the waiver, um, gloves if they needed it. And then when they got the gloves, they, uh, we had a hand sanitizer, then they'd squeeze and, and, and rub their gloves. That was that thing, so that now the gloves were, were clear. Um, and I'll say that um, I noticed a little bit more maturity in the lab, too. There's no time to mess around anymore. You know, they're right. there. We had limited time. And actually, I was surprised how well it went. Um, the only thing I'm concerned about, if I can make a point about this, is, look, if you have 24 people that signed up for a class, then you have to break the class up into three sections. So a bigger enrolled class is going to get less lab time. Somehow I think we, we, there should be some provision that if we're doing this um, adjustment to smaller labs, we almost have to have smaller enrollment too. Do you guys understand what I'm saying? Sure. Okay, that was only especially, point with, especially with the tools and uh, equipment available for, you know, a certain amount of people. In my case, it's one engine per two students, so now I have to cut that in half. Um, thank you. Thank you for that information. Yeah, I was really curious about if you saw, also, if you saw any um, hesitation or any accessibility issues with the students. Let's say the students wear uh, seeing eyeglasses, you know, for instance, and they now have to wear a face shield and other things. Did you see, and now it's fogging up. Did you see any issues like that at all with students? Just curious. No, no, un no uncomfortable issues. Um, okay. Now the face shield is something I think we can do a little bit better. So I did learn that today to get the, the cheap face shield um, and uh, you know barriers too. I'm, I'm thinking we can only progress better. We're, we're kind of a pilot group. And I think now nursing is gonna take over on campus because now nursing is considered the health uh, labs. The only thing is that, you know, somehow this needs to get across that, that our technicians are still working out there. They still need employment, you know, to fill those spots. And so we're essential as well. Just, absolutely. you know, thank whoever you, Mark. the powers. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thanks guys. Uh, so it looks like we have two more questions. We'll start with uh, Kurt first. Hi, Kurt Shabolt over at Chabot, and literally yesterday I just finished up three weeks of uh, labs with classes, uh, two different sections, an engines class and a hybrid class. Um, when it came to filling some questions for Priscilla and stuff, the, the students were great with masks. I thought that was going to be an issue. I never once had to ask a student to put a mask back on or anything like that. Um, so that wasn't a big issue. One of the things to be really concerned about is find out what your um, county health department requirements are. Here in Northern California, our different counties have their own spe specific parameters. 
And the school actually had to submit a plan of what we were going to do, how we were going to do it, et cetera, to be approved before the students could come back onto campus. Um, we did not, we were not required to do temperatures. Uh, we did ask three questions. Uh, do you have shortness of breath? Do you have a fever? Do you have a cough? Uh, one of the big things, and if you look very closely at the state, the CDC, the counties and things like that, they typically will say, maintain that six foot distance as much as possible. Because in an engines class, there's gonna be two students shoulder to shoulder at times as they're assembling that engine or disassembling something or taking a hybrid battery out of a Prius. There's times that there's gonna be two people within that six feet window. Um, you try to keep them away as much as possible. And the students did you know, self-manage that pretty effectively. Um, safety glasses, the steaming up and things like that. There's a lot of things on YouTube you can look at. I think Wendy had in there uh, some uh, dish soap stuff, uh, a piece of Kleenex under the glass, uh, under the mask at your glass edge uh, also helps. It's just to get the moisture off. Uh, but the lab side, it went well. Um, I didn't feel I was concerned at any time. The students didn't feel concerned. Uh, I have numerous students that are already in industry and having to go through a lot of that stuff. So those kind of things, it's, you know, they're assuming it's the new normal for them, for the ones that are already working. Uh, be careful with the PPE and the cleaning products. It's hard to get. So when they try to do the economy of scale that schools are going to have to do, uh, we had a hard time just trying to acquire it for about four programs that were running in that three week period it gets even more difficult when we're talking bigger scales. Um, so get them shopping early if they can. Um, we had the students provide their own masks and their own safety glasses. We did provide gloves. Um, we did wipe downs. It was a uh, kind of, it was like a 10% solution. Um, they can't do uh, bleach and things like that at colleges and schools. So you're limited on what can be used and how it can be used. Typically, it does have a rest time, so you got to spray it on, let it sit for a little bit before you wipe down. Um, so those come into play with some of your timelines. Uh, touch points on cars, they clean off pretty easily. Uh, tools are much more difficult uh, with the clean off. But uh, overall, it went pretty good. Um, we've looked at how we're going to run our falls, and we've gone to the point where essentially we're still trying to run that class of 24 kind of regretfully but we're gonna break them down into two different lab times. So our, our lab space is enough, we can handle 12 in a lab at a time. So they'll actually have, everybody will do an online together, but half the class will be signed up in a afternoon lab session and the other half might be in an evening lab session or something like that. Um, the care funds should address some of that stuff um, as well as some of the PPE and other things like that, but it's really finding out what your institution has already spent them on and what they plan to spend them on. So, two cents worth. Thank you for sharing. Um, looks like we have another person, uh, Bobby, or Robbie, I'm sorry. Yes, Bobby. Um, there's a couple of things. I wanted to piggyback on uh, Mark Birnbeck. First of all, I'm Robbie Biden from Evergreen Valley College, and um, what I was going to mention was the class size, which Mark have already uh, covered. So we typically have, we have a cap of 24 in the class. So if we had to give a lab, we would have to break that down to our maximum of eight per, um, per session inside the shop. But one of the biggest concerns I had uh, thinking about the fall semester is is the health issue as far as common colds and the flu. Um, how do we assess whether this person is uh, that sick to, to be removed or out of the session and how is that gonna affect um, our sessions as we go along? Um, and these are some of the issues. Well, this is one of the things I like to figure out what's gonna happen. Anybody got a... I'll answer that. Um, Mike Clyde, Cypress College. Uh, we've talked a lot about this. And the bottom line is you can't tell if it's the flu or COVID-19. You know, we're not medical people. So the bottom line is you have a fever, you have a cough, you have a, an upset stomach, whatever. Don't come, to, don't come to lab. If you get those symptoms while you're in lab, you need to leave and go find out what's going on. So 
it's not our, we don't have the ability to, to, to um, you know, diagnose uh, a human, you know, our, our business is, is vehicles. So, uh, but if the, the symptoms are so similar, you just have to su assume it's COVID and you can't take any chances. So we're telling students if you, you know, we, did, in fact, Paul Kelly and I did training with our summer class of incoming T10 students on Tuesday on uh, COVID-19 with a lab sheet and a presentation. And we just tell them straight out, if you have a cold or the flu or, you, or possibly COVID or, or whatever, you don't come to lab. Do not, and uh, so that's how we're taking care of it. So that's those my two cents. All right, thanks. So can I can I just ask the question? And Mike, this is uh, just just a question for you. Uh, is say they do get sick, uh, do you have any procedure or policy as to when they can return and if they can even return? We're working on that, so I honestly can't say there's a policy yet. Um, in fact, my dean is is in the room um, uh, listening. So uh, we have we're going to be meeting next week to start to set this part up. Uh, so we're, you know, your team your team has seen the T10 side of it because you know we presented all that to you guys. But um, and I was one of the one of the people on that team. But uh, the it'll it'll take it'll it's just going to each college is going to you know, set up its own procedures for that, that part. So I'm, I'm hoping we get some backing from our camp on campus um, health uh, services people, the, our, health, our um, you know, little health office to help us with some guidance on what to do in those cases. And if they'll actually be there, I don't know if they're going to be there on site in a small way when we're doing labs. If they are, it would be great because then we could have, send them over there for, uh, you know, to be looked at. But that remains to be seen. And just a uh, quick shout out, Mike, you and the rest of the T10 crew, you uh, did a phenomenal job. And so, uh, you know, appreciate all the work, the hard work you guys are doing on, on that end. Yeah, and thanks. And yeah, like I posted in the in the chat, if um, I'd, I'm w welcome to share the materials. And if you want to use them, please, you know, adapt them. I would prefer not to just to copy them and change the logo, but uh, adapt them a bit. But I, I have them. Other people have used them around the country. So if you want them, I put up my email in the chat mclyde at cypresscollege.edu. I have uh, a lab sheet, a pre PowerPoint presentation for students, and um, a bunch of resources that are PDFs that support the lab sheet. So you can take all that stuff and adapt it, so. We do have a repository online where we're gonna put all this information. So if you guys just wanna send it to us, we can put it up there to make it easy, kind of one-stop shop so your email doesn't get inundated. Okay, so yeah, so uh, maybe shoot me an email and then let me know where to exactly to send it because sure. um, that'd be great and I'll do that. And also, uh, for those of you who don't know, you can save your chat. There's a little three dots on the right, uh, lower right side of the chat. And you can go in, click on that and save the chat and print it out later. And we post that as well. So we'll have okay. everything up for you guys. All right. Let's, we have another um, comment or question from Brian. Yeah, my question was, I'm at, we re, I, I work for San Diego Continuing Ed, and we normally have pretty large classes. Uh, so when I extrapolate out a three hour lab and I need five groups or six groups to hit that, that lab, but with a limit on campus, has anyone else looked at how we're supporting as far as labor? Because if I'm doing the online class, which is a huge time vacuum, and then trying to also cover a lab that's a three hour lab that's now a 20 hour lab as far as instructor time, how have some of the colleges been dealing with that or looking at that issue? Because I can see quickly, a, you know, a hundred hour class now becomes a 300 hour class for, of instructor time. Hey, Brian, this is Kurt. Yeah, it, it does. It, it, it adds up in a hurry. Um, the other thing to remember is we're used to having labs where it's like two and three students in a group. And right. maybe it takes them an hour to do a particular task when they're alone and it's probably the weakest of the three, it's going to take that student maybe twice as long. So even your individual labs themselves will take longer than they normally did um, because of the, the diminishing in the group size. Exactly. And when I was doing out my stuff for the essential labs, like for the smog program and stuff, I was trying to go on the high end of time for the average and running multiple different stations because we only have one bar 97 machine, one OIS and so on. But I'm still looking at, I mean, normally I would have five to six lab groups at 
you know, maybe seven lab, I last class I had seven lab groups at six people per group, six to seven people per group. I mean, so I, I normally run 40 to 50 students in a class. I'm seeing Drew saying they're going to be allowed to go down to 16. So obviously there needs to be a push either. I think I need a second teacher or you got a co-teacher and have someone do the lab when someone else does the online or you got to cut the class size. I think that's probably an admin decision, but I was interested in input what's happening in other programs. Um, could, could We're doing I, all the above. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if I could speak to that for, for just a, a minute. The class size issue is certainly a key one. We had to decide that right away. The other thing, and I thought, I thought maybe Mariano, maybe he ran out of time. Um, so what I'm planning to do with my labs is I'm breaking my class of 16 into two groups of eight. They're coming in one person per vehicle. But my, I, I teach mostly in your performance areas, so I'm kind of fortunate because if you've looked at Electude, a lot of you probably know there's some very good simulations. They're quite difficult uh, for students that haven't done them before, but I want my students to rehearse the labs they're gonna actually perform uh, on Electude and get that down first. And when they are ready, then they schedule their lab time uh, to perform. And that way I can kind of keep the time managed a little better because like almost all of you, there's a certain window where I, my course can be in lab and then there's gonna be another course in the lab. I've gotta get the heck out of there. We still have the, all the cleanup to do, which will take extra time too. So I, I think if you can do a simulations and rehearsals, have them do videos, whether you're doing it as an instructor and showing them, showing them what you expect them to do and then just have them do that short critical piece in person so you can sign them off for that. That's, I don't know any other way to do it. So that's my plan at least. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I, I don't know if we just jump in, but this is uh, Alex Jones from College of Marin. And I just I was going to say what we're looking at in terms of like the labs, uh, we are, we're working with Transfer VR and we're piloting the, um, the auto curriculum. Actually, our chair actually helped design the curriculum so it aligns with his auto, 11, uh, auto 111 course. And what we're doing is we actually have like, you know, like, like uh, uh, teacher assistants uh, basically working the VR lab. So we're looking at having rotational auto labs and VR labs running simultaneously. Then when, you know, the break is we rotate group A to the VR lab, group B back to the auto lab. But then for the VR curriculum, since everything is already loaded onto the Oculus headsets uh, at that point, and you know, they have to be six feet away from each other because that's how VR works. So after each group, we just have like the TA just, you know, sanitize equipment. And we have like a whole process of what that sanitation uh, process looks like. But that's something we're hoping to, you know, integrate into the fall. Uh, just kind of setting up rotational VR labs. And I was just going to say, like, I encourage everybody, I'm, I don't work for TransVR, I work for College of Marin, but they're, they're basically uh, sending faculty who are interested in this free headsets to test the curriculum. So if that's something that you're interested in, I would definitely encourage you just reach out to their owner and say, hey, I want to test this out and see if it is something you could use and if it kind of aligns with your content. But that's just what we're looking at right now. And I just wanted to share that with everybody. Thanks. So we have about two minutes here and I wanted to get, we had one last question or comment from uh, Wendy. Hi everybody, hope you're surviving. Um, the uh, procedures for if someone gets sick, I did write something up where there's protocol. If an instructor or student's sick, we're keeping attendance. They all have to sign in it's with a schedule. Thank you, Mariana, for showing us that because we're trying to figure out what kind of schedule to use. And uh, there's protocol where who the teacher informs and then who informs the students that were in those blocks for the three days before and the three days after, um, or you know the time period that uh, we wanna isolate the groups. We're trying to keep, if they let us back, we don't know yet, um, because as we see the state of California getting worse, we need to try to get some conversation in because you know it looks like it, they might pull back if it keeps getting worse. So that's, that's my fear. Um, we were trying to get back to summer to finish the spring students so that way it doesn't interfere with our new incoming students in the fall and it gets our students graduated and that's crucial. We're a very small lab, uh, but like it involves the dean. It says the dean will notify HR if it's a faculty member that has issues, um, the nursing department. We've, we've pretty much onboarded uh, key people that have anything to do with um, uh, contacting students 
the only the ones that are allowed to contact students. That way it's not student to student. Um, you know, we don't want to get a rumor mill going because that causes paranoia. So we actually have a little thing where who notifies who and what their job entails. So the dean has to notify the management of the lab, the lab supervisor, and um, basically close down shop, sanitize, you know, so we have kind of a, we've written something out in a worst case where if something doesn't happen. So, um, and for, for Brian, Brian, I know it's tough. We um, are going to make our classes for fall 12 weeks. So we actually will end by November 14th and avoid that whole winter period, whether or not it hits or we still have enrollment issues with students because you know they're if they have kids, their kids are sick, it's the cold season. So we're we're planning on just being in the lab with our students uh, reduced. We've cut our enrollment in half. Um, but that means we have to be ready with videos. So it's asynchronous teaching. So we will not have that one-on-one -on -one live time for those one, one and a half, two hours a day, because we will be in the lab with students. So the demand is, is tougher on the students. There's more time for them to be online doing their homework and their modules, and they have to get them done before they go in a lab. That way the lab time is very efficient. It's not, like we said, the goofing around. It's, it's, it's like you're there to work. It's a job. Um, so there's a lot of different things. You know, It's a balancing act, and we really don't know what's going to work. But these kind of conversations can help, because every school is different. Every school has different needs. Um, like Mike said, if you could take verbiage that works, you know, put your entries and exit points and who's in charge of what, um, and then um, try to just supply your own stuff. The more you have to depend on the college, I feel the more likely it is you're gonna pull back. You're gonna get pushback from them. Um, we are the content experts. We do not have facilities that clean our facilities. I mean, they don't clean our shop, they don't clean our labs, so we are, putting all that verbiage in there that we are in control of our situation, that we will take uh, hold of our shop and our lab and make sure cleanliness is there. So, you know, it's, it's a tough road, people. Thank you. So we are a couple minutes over. Um, so this is uh, concluding our webinar today. Um, this was recorded and we will post it to our website. Um, as well as the, um, the chat box and other resources that we picked up. Um, and once that is posted, we'll email everyone out and with, the, with the link of where, it's, where it is. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank our speaker, uh, Mariano, for his awesome job and contribution to today's webinar, and then everyone else for the lively discussion and amazing chat box we got going. So I hope everyone has a wonderful weekend. Just want to say thank you to everyone. It was a great discussion today. Thank you. It's good to see everybody. <laughs> Even on <laughs>